Hi crew, um, as you can see here, it's actually post-test, uh, but we'll come down to Met's performance with um, Nick to do a VO2 test. Now, for those who have seen a VO2, you can understand um, what it might look like. The reason why I've come down here is um, had a pretty big Christmas and, uh, and, and summer, and it's just to get an idea of where I'm at right now. So, it's a specific test to me individually, so rather than being on, on the garment and putting in a weight and, um, and based off the general population, or what you think your capacity is, it actually gives you a really strict or um, explicit number to work from. Now you can do two, but here at Mets Performance is a lactate threshold test or a VO2. Um, given where I'm at, I thought I'd do the, uh, the, the shorter version, which is the VO2 test. Um, but yeah, Nick's gonna explain a fair bit of it and it's gonna go through what it looks like. So our absolute bread and butter here at METS is performing what we call a VO2 max test. Now you might have heard about this before or seen elite athletes do it maybe on social media, you've seen them hooked up to a mask and wondering what's sort of going on. And that's what we're gonna show you here is just a brief rundown of what ultimately a VO2 max test is, the types of things that we're measuring and then how it can actually benefit you in terms of your understanding of your own physiology and your own performance to then link back with that improving technique. Because ultimately it is a combination of what can our engine produce in terms of running speed or how well we use oxygen or maybe how well we tolerate or clear blood lactate, but then also it's a component of how effectively do we run? How can we minimize our oxygen cost and ultimately improve what we call our running economy? So that's what we're gonna show you here, a bit of an insight in terms of a VO2 max test. Oh, mum, vapor flies are in the back of the car at Pete's place. <laughs> <laughs> that high in my life. Just got clothes on, so that's just gonna go. So the test we're putting all through today is the VO2 max only test. And ultimately what we're assessing whenever we do a test like this, whether it is with blood lactate or without, like we're doing today, we're measuring someone's VO2 max, which is the maximum amount of oxygen you can take in, transport and utilize in one minute. And that's really, really critical to not only understand how the body processes ultimately aerobic energy, but also we're, the other thing we're looking for is what speed is that occurring at, or ultimately your velocity at VO2 max. It's all very well to have a really big engine and use lots of oxygen, and there's a lot of athletes out there who can use lots of oxygen, but if we can't run fast as well, it's kind of a little bit meaningless to us. So we wanna have a look at where are those both at, at a maximal level, which really sets the benchmark of what is the size of the engine, what do we need to do to be able to improve the engine, to be faster, fitter, and stronger overall. The other test that we could do is that uh, addition of the blood lactate analysis. And really the, the difference between these two is ultimately a bit of test protocol. So the test you're gonna see uh, here is a one minute ramp test. We get to VO2 max as fast as we possibly can. Reason for that is we wanna eliminate all other fatiguing factors. The other test that we do with blood lactate analysis is slightly longer. We ramp up every three minutes because we want a little bit more time at each individual intensity. And the importance of that is to allow us to get what we call a steady state. We want heart rate to sort of flatten off and stay quite consistent. Same with oxygen consumption, but it also allows us to have a steady state in our blood lactate for that intensity, or ultimately identify where there isn't gonna be a steady state and where it starts to accumulate. That information from a blood lactate perspective isn't to look necessarily at or how fatiguing are we getting? It is a bit of a marker in some uh, aspects as a fatigue marker, but it's more understanding when we do get accumulations, that's a pretty significant milestone, particularly in terms of our training zones and how we go about our training. So when we see significant or exponential increases in blood lactate, that tells us usually where things like lactate threshold or our anaerobic threshold, our functional threshold, whatever you like to call it, is gonna happen, that theoretical 45, 20 hour intensity. It also dictates things like a small increase in blood lactate above our resting is a bit of an indication of where should our long, slow running be at? Where is our base case happening? When we don't and do those long, slow, easy runs, how low is it? What heart rate should that be at? But it's not just a byproduct of blood lactate alone. We match that up with your oxygen consumption. If we're not using the oxygen well enough or we start to see a bit of a decline in that efficiency of that process of using oxygen, we're gonna get an increase in blood lactate. We have to create the energy from somewhere and there's always gonna be a contribution of aerobic and anaerobic systems. The blood lactate just happens to be coming more so from the anaerobic system or exclusively from the anaerobic system. But when we see that increase, it's a clear sign for us when we're downloading the data and having a look at it later of where do, where do these milestones happen for that individual to then ultimately dictate or what types of training do we need to do on the back of it. So really important just to understand a bit of a baseline of what your physiology looks like as a picture, but then take that information away, put that into a bit of a, a plan working forward to then be able to improve it uh, and improve your running overall.
what is the number? 55. The reason why we're doing this is to give a little bit of an understanding of the, uh, the interplay between um, how the physiology and then the, the technique um, works. So if you are using less um, effort, uh, sorry, using less energy, um, using less oxygen, as a result of moving better, it's going to play into the movements. However, then if we go into the training side of it. Yeah, so ultimately it's the it's type of thing that, Yes, we like to see really big VO2 max numbers uh, and we like to see those numbers in improving and in theory, using more options is going to be beneficial, but not always the case. Running economy as a definition is actually the oxygen cost of the movement and particularly as the distance event goes out, so when we start talking about half marathon, marathon in particular, even ultra runners as well, we want to minimise that oxygen, oxygen cost and actually use the least amount. That's going to help us from a fuel usage perspective so we can keep running all day but it's just not going to tire us out as much. We're not physically exerting as much. You're not going to be as fatigued as quickly. So it is a bit of a trade-off of, we need to build the size of the engine, which is our physiology side. That's the part that I love the most. Can we yeah, get those big, really, really high numbers? But then where the technique comes in is, well, how can we maximize that to allow us to sustain a portion of that engine for a period of time? We're not all going to run it uh, at the top end at 100% of our maximum intensity all the time. You might for short periods, but for longer distance races in particular, you're not going to run at 100% of the top end. If we have a bigger top end, well, the, the lower percentage is going to mean more. So that's where we need to move that. But ultimately, we can still get those improvements in how much of the engine we can hold by improving things like our economy. So VO2 might not change, but our marathon pace might might increase a little just because we're more economical with our energy production, our oxygen use. So we think about the economy side of it and then go into the efficiency side of it, which is two very different things. And it's been explained by probably some of um, Nick's videos as well, which is the difference between the physiological side yeah. to the movement pattern side, which is coming into this. Uh, the best example I can always think of or use is, um, and take a look at it, is the initial breaking two uh, video. Uh, and you think about those three athletes who were, were training or, or trying to break that um, the, the two hour mark. And a specific part of it is when they're going through their testing phase or the testing period, um, Elliot Kipchoge had the lowest of the three VO2 maxes uh, by a considerable margin. However, because he uses it so well in both physiological and in, in, in a training capacity, but also in a movement capacity, he can actually make more or make the most of what he has as opposed to the other two who have a less than um, efficient movement uh, and, and need that high VO2 or that huge engine to maintain the pace that they have. However, because of their movement patterns or their inefficiency of movement, um, they use it up quicker. So there's the, the, a really clear delineation or a clear example of what we're talking about. Have a better movement and a lower VO2, you can still be super effective. Or if you're going to be moving really poorly, and you need a really high engine. However, what we're talking about is trying to do both. Okay.